Well, welcome to day two of our week-long workshop of Lunch and Learns. My name is Crystal Henderson. I'm the chair of the Membership and Outreach Committee for the Rocky Mountain Emmys. I'm so glad that you can join us. Um, thank you for joining us live and also later on our YouTube page. Now, today we have a special guest from New Mexico. If you didn't know, the Rocky Mountain region not only includes Arizona, but also New Mexico, Utah, and Southeastern California. We welcome all of our high school and college students. I have links in the chat so that you can tune into our Lunch and Learns the rest of this week, as well as to get some information about entering in the Student Production Awards, which the eligibility window is open to begin that entry process right now so check it out and enter your best work so now i would love to turn it over to milton reese from new mexico santa fe new mexico joining us for our lunch and learn on this tuesday thank you milton well thank you actually and it's really an honor to be here um i yes and the, the rocky mountains the base of the lowest part of the rocky mountains the most southern part of the rocky mountains i actually look out my window and i can see them right now so yes we are part of the rockies <laughs> and yeah i'm here at santa fe uh, at, in santa fe um in my real world i am a co-chair of the film department uh, actually the film and digital arts department at santa fe community college i have come here i think i left LA about eight years ago, something like that. Seems like an eternity. Um, and it's, I mean that in a good way. Um, it's a wonderful place to be here because I came out here sort of as a leap of faith. One of the TV shows I was working on got canceled and they all do. Uh, so, and I just sort of woke up one morning and I said, hey, look, I think I am actually moving. And everybody said, no, Milton, you're not going anywhere. You've never moved anywhere in 25 years. I said, well, I think this is it. I just been burned out. And so I came out here to Santa Fe for a long weekend. And by the end of the weekend, I was a resident. I fell madly in love with it. And then I took a, a nickel tour of the college. And by the end of the tour, they gave me a job. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the rest is history, as they say. But uh, today, we're actually, I was asked to talk a couple of times, uh, today and tomorrow, both. Um, and today, we're just going to talk about the evolution of cinematic storytelling. Now, of course, that's like 150 years of information. I'm going to try to cram it into about 30 minutes. So um, it might be a challenge, and good thing it is being recorded, because you can play it back if you're so interested. Um, cinematic storytelling really is uh, the newest incarnation of who we are as a species, uh, human species. I mean. And uh, because really, when it comes right down to it, we are by nature, literally by nature, storytellers. Um, it's a part of who we are from necessity as well as out of entertainment. Uh, when storytelling first began, I mean, come on, we drew on cave walls. It's like it, we, we drew maps to show where the herds of animals are or where to avoid going because of a volcano or whatever. It's all storytelling. That's all it is, it's storytelling, it's information sharing. And it eventually evolved into the getting into the outside world, you know, sitting around the campfires. And for thousands of years, uh, we would sit around campfires telling stories about, oh, did, did you see what I did today? Or did you pity we lost George today? I mean, he was a great guy, but, uh, you know, he had a good life. You know, it's all about the, ex the expression of our lives through hopefully somewhat of an entertainment story or storytelling. And then, and really the only difference about sitting around a campfire telling a story and what we're doing now is we're just sitting around a different kind of campfire. The screen you're watching right now is nothing more than that. It's nothing more than a campfire that allows us a venue. It's just a lot bigger of a venue. So really what I'd like to start on is going into how important it is for us as humans to continue telling stories. And I think it all begins really with the alphabet. Now, yes, it sounds kind of stupid, I suppose, but it's really the critical component for storytelling because within those 26 letters, of course, in different languages, there's more and less, but within those letters is every story that's part of our lives from our birth the stories of our childhood, when we start school, our first crush, our first date, when we get married, when we get divorced, when we get remarried. Um, it's all in the alphabet. It's an infinite number of stories that can be told by just these 26 letters. Now, when you think about it, that's pretty cool. 
because all of human history is told within these images, these symbols, whether it's hieroglyphics, whether it's cave paintings or drawings, it all comes from a simple, simple series of elements. And that is the coolest thing about being human is we can do that. And people listen, they may get entertained, they may get told about some event going on, whether it's a storm coming up or whatever the case, but it all starts with the simplest of letters. And we put them together in a brain, we tell people, they repeat it again and again and again, hopefully in the right way. Um, but it's really quite remarkable when, we, when you think about it. So storytelling is where we started as a species, and I suspect is where we will end as a species. But the means of telling those stories is evolved, hugely evolved. Um, I guess, you know, like I mentioned, it's, or we all know that, you know, the evolution of, of storytelling of technology really didn't change that much over for thousands of years. If there was a change, it sometimes took hundreds of years. It was only until about the mid, late 1700s that the industrial age came into play. And that was really the building of machines. That's all it is. It's the building of machines, sometimes to build bigger and better machines, uh, sometimes to help with mining, sometimes help with communication, sometimes help with agriculture. Um, it's all about just those machines, building different machines to help us communicate and talk and tell and get our ideas across. Well, once the industrial age in the light, and again, in the, it really didn't really take full on hold until the 1800s, it still wasn't that quick in coming. It was still a matter of a generation before there was another big change in, the, in machines. And it was the machines, however, that led us into now our current storytelling and abilities. Um, it was really in the 1870s that the really the, the carbon arc lighting began. And with the electricity and all a carbon arc light is, is just two welding rods effectively getting together and then there's an arc, hence the name carbon arc. And it created illumination. Well, now illumination may not sound that important, but it allowed us to create projecting systems that allowed us to project both still images as well as moving images, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, moving images have been around and in helping us tell stories probably for, well, since about 18, I think it was 1833 that the first zoetrope came into place. And it was just basically a small light source in the middle of a wheel uh, I guess this would be a better way to do it, around a wheel. And the wheel, you would spin it, and it would project different images on the wall. And all a moving image is, is a series of still images. It's our eye that makes them work. It, it creates the motion. So again, it's the 1830s was really the first time we were able to communicate and tell stories on a pretty large level, pretty large scale level, um, with the use of machine and electricity. Now, electricity has been around for, well, forever, lightning, you know, that thing that just like scares both animal and human alike, it's all electricity. But before we just didn't harness it really until the 1700s, late 18, 1700s into the 1800s. And again, why is that so important? It's because it allowed us to project our images. Now that's what all film is, is the projection of a story. So let's talk a little bit about the first projector. Really, the first electric projector came about in, uh, I believe it was 1879. And it was a rudimentary thing that just, it really, it just projected um, still plates or still images from a glass plate that moved on, on a chain in front of a light source. And again, it, unlike the zoetrope, which was really just slits in a piece of cardboard, now we're able to project a very detailed image, an actual photograph or photographic plate. And again, it didn't take long for storytellers to adopt that into their means of convincing or telling stories. So then we ended up going from that into um, the, well, and then also the first creation of a actual movie camera was in the 1870s and it was a root oh it was an archaic thing it was actually built on the stock of a rifle 
and it recorded 12 images in a drum, still images. And the barrel was, I'm guessing it was probably about three inches in diameter. It was nothing more than a lens. Um, and again, none of those images, I don't even think that any of those images still exist, but it was the first time a camera was used to record a story. And, my, and I believe the first thing it recorded was a military action in Europe. Uh, I think, I'm not 100% sure about that. So really, um, um, it's the first time that there was actually, I won't say broadcast, but, um, but projected news from around the world. And that, again, is how far back it goes. So the part of, so again, we ended up with electricity being created, the mechanics or the machines being built. The machines led to the creation of the zoetrope, which led to the projector. Cameras we've had since the 1840s, roughly, and uh, still cameras, but motion picture cameras and were first, first came about in around 1879. Um, the first real cameras, um, or the 1870s, the first mass produced cameras were in the 1890s. And these were wind up, cameras. There's no electricity. It's just all manually made. And, and again, they were very detailed, uh, very, oh, they were perfectly designed like a clock mechanism. That's basically what they were. Um, the, um, the part of the area that really started to change was we had the industrial age, but in, we then started getting into what's called the age of information. And the age of information, by all accounts, started in the 19, mid, mid 1900s, uh, 19, after World War II. But really, the age of information began in 1895 with the first wireless radio. And it was developed by Marconi, and he developed a, uh, the, he basically was able to send over the airwaves or over the, the, uh, the radio waves um, communication. It started off with a wireless Morse code, but then ended up with voice. And that created the ability to tell stories, not just to a handful of people, but literally around the world. So now for the first time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, information could be passed and stories could be passed around the world. Never before in the history of humankind was that even a consideration. But now, just because of the radio waves, um, we could do that. And again, so now it didn't take long for storytellers to get into the place. And they started being able to tell stories. And we've, uh, you know, radio shows, everything started popping up almost overnight because it could. Information was still a challenge and there was a responsibility to tell the right information. And again, even like today, which we're always dealing with uh, information misinformation uh, that comes across uh, comes across um, social media and we have a responsibility to really focus and tell as close to the truth as we can even back then that was still an issue so it was, it's nothing new it's always been around as long as there's been photographs in fact there's been propaganda or misinformation um, even um, uh, Matthew Brady, who was a, a, the one of, the, he's really known as the grand, the grandfather of photography. He really was um, amazing when it came to photographing the Civil War. But even he manipulated the images in front of him. He would rearrange bot corpses on the battlefield to make it a better image, to tell a stronger story. Now, yes, the battles were horrifying, don't get me wrong, but he just added to that. So again, is social media manipulation new? Not at all. It's been around for 150 years or more. And so again, so really when we have to remember that since the first click of the shutter, manipulation of information has also been around. So the age of information again, started with the advent of the wireless radio. And it then allowed us to put not only sound with, uh, or sound tell sound stories, but also now combine them with pictures. Because again, you had, si you had movies, but they were silent. You had to have cards that told what people were thinking or saying. Um, it 
was when you join, when you were able to join what sound waves were and then what the picture is and put them together, marry them together in one image, then you could start really showing and telling stories. And those came about in the late, uh, late uh, teen, well, early, really the early 1920s. And that's when uh, sound became part of all films. Directors, for instance, that could direct sound, silent films potentially couldn't do it with sound. Actors, it made careers and lost and destroyed careers because there were silent film actors that had horrible sounding voices. They just didn't carry or they just weren't able to remember lines. They could facially gesture anything, but when it came to coming up with lines and remembering, remembering dialogue, remembering scripts, they weren't able to. Their careers were over with. So you ended up with a lot of individuals, I guess, that could just, that really didn't have the ability to carry on the storytelling. So that opened it up to new in, new in, individuals, ones that had technology skills, technological skills that could allow them to develop equipment, perhaps. They could record por uh, you know, portable uh, dialogue out on location as opposed to being in a studio. So there's so much that went into the age of information. But really, and then again, we have to, and then in, the, in and around the 1920, late 20s and early 30s, television first came about. And people think, oh, well, that was a product of the 50s. And no, well, it was primarily. But people forget that, or don't even know in many instances, that television got its start in the late 1920s and mostly into the 30s in Europe. Um, it was developed primarily by the French, by the Germans. Um, and it was really underutilized. It would actually even project, but over short distances. It didn't really take off until the 50s. So during that whole mid, uh, 19, the mid 1900s, still storytelling was principally told through radio or through movies. That was it. But, and there were great stories being told, endless stories being told. Cinematic storytelling really started to come into its own. It was a studio run system. It was every studio had their own productions. They had their own talent. They had their own directors, all of them under contract. They all had these massive studio complexes in Los Angeles and New York, a couple of, of course, in Europe as well, um, all over Europe. Um, movies have always been huge. And who doesn't want to be in the movies? Who doesn't want to tell a story like that? Everybody does. They ended up eventually, however, uh, getting reduced down because they owned not only the studios and the ability to make the films, but also they owned the, they owned the, uh, the theaters. So you had Paramount Productions and you had Paramount Productions that owned Paramount Theaters. You had Universal's theaters, you had Columbia, you had Warner Brothers, you had every major production company owned also the, the, their distribution outlets. That became a monopoly. And so the government stopped that so that they had to split up. And so now you've got the ability for independent productions to, to actually show their films at huge, massive theater chains. That really pushed storytelling to the nth degree. And that was really, I mean, that was really what set it up and it, at that point really became the age of super information because now it was like anybody, almost anybody that had money, that's the key word there, that had money could tell a story and get the information out. Now there still wasn't a lot of television going on, there very little in fact, but there was a lot of radio, but it was in the 50s, 1950s that um, television really came into its own. It was the birth of television. It was the golden age of television is what they called it. And the golden age of television was not necessarily that golden, but it did, again, allow stories and cinematic storytelling to now be broadcast, like radio, broadcast into everybody's home. So no, no longer did you actually have to now go to the theater to see a story. You could have it given to you while you're having dinner. 
at your, in your living room. You could have it uh, de delivered to you like you have your newspaper delivered to you. Okay, so now it is literally the age of super information. Anybody can get any information at any time. Still, it was not perfect by any means. I'm not certain it is perfect yet either. Um, but, um, but it was now in the, during the 50s and 60s that you, could that you would be sitting around the dinner table and movies became a little concerned because now you had actors that were in movies going into the dinner table at everybody's home. So their popularity went through the roof. So it's a very interesting part of that, uh, that equation in the 60s and 70s. It was in the 80s that, it, again, it really took off again. Because now it was the mid-80s is when the first digital recordings started taking place. Because it, before that, it was all analog. It was all mechanical. Everything was mechanical. Even television, it was like recording on a magnetic piece of tape. Well, that's what it was. And then projecting it or playing it back. Um, pretty crappy images, by the way, but it worked because, again, it got the stories out, and that was the key. But now in the digital, now in digital, with the digital technology, which we basically have today, um, it, again, revolutionized the ability to record and also play back. Now, it took a while for it to get really to where it is right now, but, um, but it's a, it was the digital age is what really, really starts the, where you and me can produce stories without one major element. What is that other element? It's money. We don't need a lot of money now to tell and get our stories out. And now, especially, oh my God, especially today um, with, with our, I mean, everybody at the, just, I mean, for heaven's sakes, you know, this device alone has revolutionized the world literally has revolutionized the world we all have it there's i there's is you're hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't have a device on them that can record and tell stories show stories and get it to the world immediately news agencies everybody uses them films great films great stories are being told every day by these devices so again we came from simple storytelling on a cave wall, sitting around a campfire, then eventually projecting images through various means of technology, mechanics, all of it, uh, to recording it on film, a celluloid actually, then film, uh, and then eventually moving into the video world, slowly, but moving into the video world, where the video world then started moving into the digital world, digital images, and then digital images are now where we're at. So where are we now? Well, we are now in the, again, the age of instant super information, where information can come from anywhere in the world, actually, even not even anywhere in the world, even the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the International Space Station can, can broadcast or can send us information instantaneously. We, as a species, have evolved because we're able to accept information coming in from 20 different sources, 20, 100 different sources at the same time. And we can comprehend it. We can hopefully eliminate some of it out of the equation because some of it's probably garbage, but we're able to accept it. And that's the evolution of the human species, the human mind. So the evolution of cinematic storytelling really is coincides with the evolution of who we are as a species and what we are able to comprehend. Um, there's older individuals, myself included, that may have difficulty use, using TikTok. I, in fact, to be honest, I used to call, to call it Tic Tac until about a year ago. Then some of my students corrected me, um, humorously corrected me, I think. Um, and they ended up uh, informing me a little bit more about what social media and what TikTok and other aspects can really do. It's moving the world ahead faster than we ever thought possible. So the, so I guess really in roughly a little less than 30 minutes, I've tried to cover the 5,000 years of storytelling and the 150 years of cinematic storytelling. Um, I think it's important for everybody who wants to get in the film, in the film industry, in the film world, um, 
to understand where we come from, where cinematic storytellers come from. Because without knowing where we came from, we won't know where we're going. And if it's left to the devices of the powerful, if it's left to the devices of only the money to tell us where we're going, we're doomed. It's up to us as humans, as a species, to get our voices out there. It may not, we may not agree with everybody. Everybody not, may not agree with us. That's not the point. The point is to get our information out there, to get storytelling out there, to get information to one person or a thousand or a million or a billion people. We have the ability to do that now. Um, it's also not the ability, so much the ability, but it's also the res responsibility. Um, I think that's the hardest part is to teach the responsibility of cinematic storytelling. Documentary filmmaking, the news agencies, everybody does incredibly well with it. Reality TV, even reality TV is entertainment. It's not necessarily real, um, but it is there. Um, narrative filmmaking, st literal storytelling, the entertainment aspect of storytelling. That's a huge part of the equation. And that's always gonna be evolving. All of these are all gonna be evolving. The technology is part of it. As I mentioned before, back in before, even before the industrial age, changes in society happened over the course of hundreds of centuries. Then the age of industrial, the industrial age took over and now change started happening within maybe a generation, then maybe even 10 years, big things would happen. We, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> excuse me. We are now in an age where technology changes literally by the time you read it or get it. How many of us, uh, it changes. How many people have bought a camera, phone or whatever, and by the time you get it out of the box and start using it, there's a new version out. It's happening so fast. I'm not thinking that's necessarily good. Um, but it's happening so fast. And again, that's something we have to, as a, as a society, I think we have to not monitor, but we have to be aware that that change is going to take the, when the change happens so fast that nobody can keep up with it, it, it may have an issue that spirals society out of control. So we have to, and I'm not saying we have to keep things in check. We just need to be aware of it. Uh, we need to take a little bit more time and focus attention onto what is going on, how fast it's happening, who is making it, what are the ill effects, and what are the positive effects that this particular change can happen. One person alone or one group alone cannot handle that, cannot keep an eye on it. It's up for to all of us. Everybody here who watches this, everybody who's all of my students, I tell them basically the same thing, that it's up to you to really focus attention onto where we are going. So again, what is the question? Where are we going? Well, that's up to you. Um, it's where we go is guided by where you want to go. Um, I don't know if there's anything more that can be said because I think the most thing that can be said is myself and a generation that's, you know, I was born in 1960. Um, and all I can do, I understand half of the technology. I'm lucky. I understand mo half, at least half the technology that's out there right now. There's a lot of individuals that don't, but it's up to us, even those that don't, to help support those that do. Uh, it's our duty. It's our honor, to be quite honest. Um, so again, where are we going as a society? Well, you tell us. You tell us where you want to go, and we will at least do. At least I'll do my best to make sure it happens. Um, I th didn't think I could be able to do it, but in thirty minutes, I've covered the crux of cinematic storytelling from beginning to well to where we're at now. Um, I hope that this gives you at least a little idea of where to look for information. And again, don't be afraid to look for information. Learn the history of where you want to go. If you want to be a director, learn the history of directing, learn writing, learn from the masters, learn from even before the masters, listen to music, play music, learn still photography, look at every part of, the, of who it is we are, where we are in the world as storytellers, 
And also when you get on set for the first time, I guarantee you learning this, what my students have a tendency to call useless trivia, um, they will, I guarantee you at lunchtime, somebody will be talking about some silly event that took place in history, in the history of filmmaking. And if you know the answer, you will get work. So there's a very pragmatic reason for understanding useless trivia. Um, so do the research, understand everything that goes into where we're at uh, as broadcasters, as filmmakers, as storytellers, as documentarians. Um, all of it is storytelling and all of it is critical for who we are as a species and where, and if we're gonna even succeed or even if we're gonna live past another 50 years, it's up to us, but more importantly, it's up to you to go out and tell those stories. Understand the world around you, tell it to the, anybody who's able to listen, even a few that don't. <laughs> so really, I guess that's about it. I don't know if there's how many people are there and able to ask questions, but um, I will uh, provide, uh, I will provide to, uh, uh, to the organizers of this, of this luncheon my information. Uh, so if anybody's interested in emailing me, uh, they most certainly can. Um, if you have questions about um, classes, about film production, New Mexico is, a, is really uh, the heart and center of, the, of this region, of the Four Corners region of filmmaking. I mean, in fact, outside of LA, New York, Georgia, a couple other areas, we are number one. I mean, we are, in fact, Santa Fe was voted, I believe the, the second most livable city for filmmakers um, in, uh, in the United States. So again, if you have any questions, uh, that's what I do. I've done it for 35 years plus change. Um, and if I can ever offer suggestions on who to go to, why to go there, why not to go there, uh, I have no shortage of opinions, not any more valuable than anybody's, but at least I'll get share it with you. So I guess, I guess um, that's, I guess, you know, Crystal, that's probably about it yeah. for me. Wonderful. I have a question. Uh, sure. Actually, I have a couple questions. I guess I'll give them both straight up. So one, I was wondering, yes, you know, streaming TV shows seems to be the real thing right now. Yeah. So uh, my first question is, why do you think we're really gravitating towards streaming these TV shows and we're getting caught up in these stories versus I don't hear so many people chatting about going to the movies as much as you know, maybe before the pandemic, uh, I feel like we're really going into the TV uh, land, so to speak. Um, so that was one of my questions. And then also with it being free to produce all this content um, online, all the YouTube videos and everything, it can be really overwhelming all the <laughs> options that we have. So how do we make sure that we're, how do you make sure that you as a creator are standing out to these viewers that you want to target? Those are two brilliant questions. Um, I guess this is going to take up the next half hour. <laughs> um, this is really, I think the first question is what about, you know, what about the streaming services and the streaming video? That's, I think, is a, a simpler question that you might think there is an answer for. And that is, it's really about being able, as a, well, as a filmmaker, it's about being able to tell a longer story, a story that is not encapsulated in two hours or an hour and a half. Hour and a half story is nothing more than a short story. But now with streaming services and binge watching and television specifically, you are able to tell, a, you're able to tell volumes of a story. Can you imagine Game of Thrones being told in two hours? It would be literally impossible. Um, but being able to tell it in a, in a series with, with what, eight, nine seasons, eight seasons, whatever it is, um, you can tell an unlimited, unlimited stories. And now the, with the binge watching part, that's where it's really exciting for a lot of storytellers because now it's not so much, because there's two types, there used to be two types of television. There was episodic television and there was serialized or I'm, I'm sorry, a procedural television and serialized. Procedural is like the type of TV I grew up with in the 60s, the 70s, even into the 80s, um, actually even into the 90s for that matter. And procedural is like, there's a detective story. It has one main actor or one main character, maybe a couple of supporting characters. And um, episode one is a murder that takes place in a, in a, in a, in a cemetery. 
And then episode two is, a, is the same characters, but solving a murder that takes place in a uh, hospital or on an ocean liner. And then the next episode, I mean, it's the same characters, just different stories. So that's procedural. Serialized is like what Game of Thrones is. It's one continuous story that goes from the beginning of episode one in season one to the not the end of the season, but to the end of the series, however long that is, whether it's five years, 10 years, whatever it is. So it's one continuous story. So you've got serialized, which is that uh, type of long format story. And you've got procedural, which is the um, episode, really episode by episode. And then there's also a com somewhat of a hybrid, which is a kind of a combination of the two where you have a lot of different stories going on, but then you have one through line. Uh, a good example is X-Files um, is really a wonderful example. You always have like, okay, uh, you know, uh, Fox and Scully going through, um, you know, uh, what's like, uh, you know, the mystery of what's, you know, vampire here or something going on there and something else going over here. Every episode is a little bit different, but you still have the same through line that went through. It's like, we are not alone in the universe. And every now and again, the smoking man would come back into play and focus attention onto where the big picture is. But yet it still surrounds the small you know, individual parts of it. So really, there are, those are the elements. Now, how it ended up in the, in the streaming service, um, it allowed filmmakers to start telling these stories, not as a, because before, procedural was the name of the game. Networks would not consider producing anything that was not procedural. You had to smuggle other information in, hence X-Files. But it was rare that there would be a long ongoing thing because you had to wait a week until the next episode. And so people would forget what's going on. So you didn't really focus that way. But now people are able to focus attention on, I mean, they're able to sit and watch two, three, five episodes in a night. So you can have a story that has a beginning and an end because this, people will be able to watch it. So why is it so popular streaming service? Because you can tell longer stories more effectively and the audience will watch it. Um, the other part, and plus also it's uh, the pandemic really helped bring, bring that into fruition. Before it's always been around for years, decade probably, but the pandemic really set it, set it in stone. And the next question, I, and would you please repeat what the next question was, I forgot. You got it. And thank you so much for answering that last question. Uh, yes. So with it being free now to produce so much content and you could access it anywhere, how do you as a creator, as a filmmaker, how do you stand out above all the other noise to really show your craft and, and your talent? Well, for, know the technology and know the skill set and the art. Um, there's been a number of times, this is a really nothing new, where I'd be on set and uh, a director might say, well, we don't need, or a producer worse yet, then they should know better, um, would come in and say, well, we don't need a gaffer, a lighting director, because the cameras today, they can record under those lowest of light levels. That may be true, but you still need to have somebody that understands how light works. You have to understand, and because if it's not a quality produced, if it's not well written, if it's not well acted, if it's not well directed, people aren't going to watch it. So you can have. So if you want to stand out, learn the craft of filmmaking, learn the skills of what proper music is, how to use audio. That's probably the weakest link everybody has. That isn't that they think. Oh well, audio it doesn't matter. Oh yes, it does. Oh yes, it does. Especially when you're talking about a device like this, because the picture is only going to be this big. If the audio is not good, people are not going to watch it. So yeah, you can produce all the content in the world. You can produce a thousand videos. And if, if the content, if it's not well produced, people aren't going to watch it. Um, major companies, production companies, scour YouTube and every streaming service that there is to see what new talent are out there. And they look to see a couple of things. One, how, how many followers is this show or this cert, this um, web series have if it has over it have if it has like a couple hundred they're not going to look at it a couple thousand still not going to look at it hundred thousand yeah they'll look at it a couple million 
you may be the next uh, producer of a major t a TV show. Um, people aren't going to look at it if it's, I'll be honest, if it's crap, people aren't going to look at it. They might, unless they're your grandmother, maybe your kids or whatever, but they're not going to look at it. It's up to you, the filmmaker, to learn the craft of filmmaking and then put it into action. Um, filmmaking is not easy. It's, you are really, people think, oh, well, it's just point a camera and shoot. No, it's, there's months, if not years, that go into storytelling because you have to organize everything from the simplest of props to the actors that are there, good actors, hopefully. Um, you have to figure out what your story is. What are your locations? Do you need permits to film in this location? Do you need licensing agreements because you have a piece of art in the background? Uh, and that can lead into horrible things. Um, so again, there's a lot that goes into it, the legality, the practicality of filmmaking. And that's something that a lot of people don't take seriously until they're sued and or they're told to cease and desist on this project or they're suddenly a project they worked two years on, they don't own it anymore because they filmed it in, a, in the area without getting the right permits or location agreements. There's a lot that goes into it. If you wanna be a success, and again, I don't care how big of a project it is, you have to learn the practicality of filmmaking. Um, that's how you basically stand out, is if you have all your ducks in line, if somebody looks at this project on, the, on their phone, um, and they say, oh my God, what an amazing film. I gotta wait, I can't wait to the next episode. That's how you stand out. That's really very simple. So I don't Thank know. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Anybody else have any questions? Well, again, if there is anybody out there who watches this and they want to get a hold of me, uh, if you have even just some criticisms, please get a hold of me. Um, if you have any advice that you'd like to get, I'm full of it. No, I mean, I have plenty. Um, and um, if you'd like to uh, just even just simply um, uh, chat and find out, I, I, um, you know, being an educator is, is my new incarnation. But again, I spent 35 years working in the trenches. And so, uh, and everything from... Um, writer, director, even an actor on a couple of kids TV shows to uh, uh, not my best acting, by the way. Um, and also, but in technical, I was a lighting director, tech director um, on a lot of projects, uh, mostly pilots uh, for NBC and other networks or, or affiliates or, or subsidiaries, not affiliates. Um, get a hold of me. I'm always happy to talk, uh, at least to maybe point you in the right direction or at least a different direction than where you might be heading. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Milton. Thank you for taking us through the evolution of film, answering our questions. We so appreciate your time. We're excited to see you again tomorrow for our next Lunch and Learn. Mm -hmm. And for those of our students that are watching um, Pacific time or Arizona time, that'll be 11 a.m. on Wednesday, April 6th but noon time for other students in our region, including New Mexico, where Milton is yeah. joining us live from. So really, really excited. Um, it looks like, oh, we might have a question here. Oh, in the chat, yes. From Bryce. I'll grab that before we end the chat. Thanks for joining us, Bryce. Oh, very cool. So would I uh, entertain a similar visit uh, with another teacher's classroom? I certainly would. I'm always open for anything like that. Um, part of it is as a teacher, like I mentioned, my newest incarnation, uh, not my last one, <laughs> but my newest. Um, and I work with a lot of the institutions here in New Mexico, but also in a couple of different states, um, working with classrooms, working with how to get technology into the hands of even smaller colleges. We're a small college, but even high schools that work on a high school level. In New Mexico, we have what's called the dual credit program, which allows students to take, and while in high school, take um, classes in college and get credit uh, both in high school and uh, college, hence dual credit. Um, we have a lot of film students um, in high school that are 
on the, on the road to getting into the industry the minute they graduate from high school. And it's due to the community college system here in New Mexico. So I would happily talk with anybody about anything that has to do with education. I am not an expert, but I certainly have some experience and, uh, and certainly uh, a lot of opinions, so. <laughs> Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. And um, I will let I will let you guys um, get in touch. And you know what, I can even send over if you can, Milton, send over. I have your contact and then um, I can go ahead and connect you with anyone who reaches out here um, looking to uh, connect with you beyond this point for any future opportunities. Perfect. Yeah. And yeah, just and please don't hesitate. Just uh, get a hold of me by email. And that's probably the easiest way, to be honest, because uh, this is New Mexico and my cell doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Milton. We'll see you back here then tomorrow. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you, you tomorrow. Bet. You bet. See ya.